Tú puedes que si quisiera, si quieres hacer la consulta, ¿no? Este, depende de quiénes están acá. Yo creo que me voy a mostrar. Es que estoy la nueve. Y justo, por ejemplo, hoy día, para los invasos y los niños, sí. Pero ahorita están todos preparándose para el flash mob, que van a ser en el closing ceremony. Sí, y además, también va a haber, primero, un poquito que ya se presenta a vos. Sí. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for your assistance. This is the launch of the book called The Challenge of Digital Democracy Towards an Interconnected Citizenship. It is a book uh, written by Elaine Ford, sitting next to me. Um, today, we will comment it by Manuel Aces, Manager of Public Policy and Government Affairs of Mex Mex Google Mexico, by Ellison Dionis, Youth Observatory Chair from Internet Society, and by myself, Paola Galvez, I'm a Public Policy and Legal Counsel. Now I'm gonna give the, the microphone to Edison Dionis to start his comments. Uh, thank you, Paola. Well, as she said, I'm the, the president of the youth Observatory, and I'm from Brazil. Uh, well, uh, we cannot speak about uh, digital democracy without speak about the internet. How it is important for us and for everybody to have access to have access not just for the technology but the knowledge to use and to you know explore the potential of the internet. So. Uh, well, as you all know, nowadays the internet is, is becoming more popular and a lot of more people have access to the technology into the internet. And with this, we have the opportunity to use this tool as a way to, uh, to express our liberty or or rights, and uh, with these, we are becoming like, uh, well, s some people call it uh, digital citizens, because we are like, uh, kind of uh, making our experience with citizenship going uh, to the internet too. We are using it as a tool to express ourselves and to manifest the things that we need, that, to, that the society needs. So uh, with this, we have to talk about how can the, this tool be used to, uh, to bring like uh, our rights, not just uh, uh, like new rights or legitimized ones, but being re uh, recognized to fight for for it to be respected. So this is one of the things, one of the good things that you all are going to find in this book that Elaine made because this is uh, one of the one of the best like a, a compilation of a lot of knowledge and experiences and how you can like understand it in a full like have a full view of how the the internet how the technology is changing the democracy not just online but offline too and how it can contribute for to achieve the, the goals of not just the SDGs, but uh, like to make the world and the, the virtual, the physical world better. So uh, 
well, just to let you understand a little about my background, I was a Google Policy Fellow last year in the in the organization that Elaine is here representing, and was one of the the biggest experiences of my life because. Well, I have the the knowledge about the Brazilian. Well, I have the overview about about the Brazilian democracy, what things happen there, but I didn't had the the experience with any other countries. And I was in Peru. I lived there for two months and a half, and was in the pre-election months, so I had a lot of, of experience, like I, a live experience in how things is happening, how internet is being uh, used and is influencing the ways things are going in the government, in the democracy, in the society, and everything, and how it can uh, change the way we do democracy. And I saw that not just the Brazilian side of that, but I had the overview in how this is happening in other countries too, in Peru in this case. So, uh, well, in this book, in the book of that Elaine is launching here, we had the, we have this opportunity to have an overview, uh, new knowledge about uh, what's happening in another country, in a Latin American country, uh, that can like uh, make us have uh, a new perspective on how internet technology can change the democracy. So, uh, no, I recommend you all to read it because it's really it's a really good uh, overview, and this is all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Now, uh, please, Manuel Aces from Google Mexico is going to give his comments. Well, first of all, it's it's an honor to be here presenting this this great book. I had a chance to read it the, this week. And I think it very well aligns with the work that we have been conducting uh, in the region in Latin America, because advancing the research in democracy in the digital times, it's crucial for how information flows and, and how, how people start receiving uh, knowledge and uh, get, get used to, to shift how, the, how uh, powers are elected and, and how how uh, basically the strings of, of society get, get made, right? So I want to make a few comments about the contents of this book. I really enjoyed uh, its, its divisions. It's uh, basically divided in four chapters. You will find in, on the first chapter a definition of, di of digital democracy, which actually uh, contributes, and it's one of the, of the most recent uh, research and, and most uh, recent uh, documents that can actually put forward new knowledge on what the, the digital democracy is. Um, the second chapter actually is referred to, uh, just a second. <laughs> the second chapter is a definition of, of, of digital citizenship with empowering and change in digital age. And in that sense, it clearly analyzes all the challenges that that uh, citizens are facing, uh, are facing right now worldwide and which are being, being basically laid out, especially in, in countries, in emerging countries like uh, the ones in Latin America, where we are uh, seeing strong shifts of 180 degrees in the political, in the political um, agendas and the political alignments of, of the presidents within the, the, the region. In chapter three, you will find uh, politics in digital times. And for me and for Google, I think is, uh, this was the most, the most uh, relevant chapter in the book because it actually engages in the, the issues and the permanent uh, and, and the relevant uh, challenges that we, th that we are facing right now worldwide and in the region, especially since I work in a digital platform, how we need to actually improve 
improve these conversations and engage clearly and uh, with a front face towards uh, these challenges that, that we are facing upon. And chapter four, I think, closes with a very good uh, summary of what, the, what, what internet governance is and human rights and exercise of human rights online. And I want to take some, some time to, to actually, to actually uh, be more specific on, on chapters one and chapters three, which I think are the more relevant for, for us as a company to, uh, well, as, as a platform to be commenting on. I really love the fact that, that uh, democracy is now facing, uh, is now comprehending, at least for Latin American times, that this is, these are the first elections in the past uh, three or, or, or four years that, that Latin American democracies are facing new elections with the, the context of, of having the internet as a forefront and, and the, being the main scenario or one of, of the main scenarios where the, the, the political campaigns are, are being made. Latin America right now is, has a digital divide of 64% people connected. So we still have a 36% of, of people who are not online. And this has recently been achieved in the past four years. That roughly means about uh, 400 million people connected. 400, yeah, 400 million people connected. Um, and you know, this is the first time that the majority of the population in Latin America are engaged in conversations online. So we have most of, of the 50%, almost in, in uh, six out of, out, out of 10 people are now changing and, and facing the changes of, of the, the dynamics of how they, they recollect information and how they engage in research about their political candidates. And actually, this has decentralized the means of communications, not only from the citizen towards the, the, the soon to be elected the public officers, but as well as the governments and the challenges that they are facing towards uh, communicating elections and the dynamics between the, the newsletters the, the newsletters and news information and news agencies about how, how to conduct real information for uh, which is pertinent for the for the citizen in that sense i think chapter 1 captures clearly that uh, digital democracy is actually based in citizen participation freedom of expression and opinion access to information freedom of association and plurality of, 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 of political parties, and uh, transparency and accounting, and, and accountability, I'm sorry. And in that sense, all, all the, the, the new political actors are embedded within an, a, a digital ecosystem. And I would like to, to actually comment a little bit on, on what Google has been doing in order to, to actually uh, strengthen all these, these elements in the region. For example, in citizen participation, we have been clearly advocating for, for uh, candidates to use, to use internet as a new channel of communication, to, to actually engage in their, their YouTube channels and, and to, to engage actively in, in uh, digital conversations with their, with their soon to be uh, elected con uh, constituencies. In that sense, this is a new means of communication which, which is uh, re revolutionizing, revolutionizing how Candidates are engaging. Actually, they are doing this in real-time engagements. Uh, we have so far, for example, within the region, two newly elected presidents. We have reached more than one million uh, viewers and uh, subscribers in their YouTube channels. Uh, this is the case for Mexico and Brazil, for example. And they are well-regarded uh, candidates completely from different uh, political spectrum, which when you magnify the, the, the quantities of the subscribers, you can magnify the impact that they can have in how to shape political debate. Uh, regarding freedom, freedom of expression and opinion, we have always regarded internet and as, a, as a decentralized platform, which since its, its inception, its main goal, I suppose, uh, I, I believe, was to actually decentralize the, the means of conversations. In, in the past 50 years, what internet has achieved is that we used to have a monolithic and, and centralized uh, means of communicating uh, between each other, which the means were, I think, concentrated and, 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 and were not, not very well distributed in that sense. And now the platforms have, sorry, <laughs> the platforms have begun to shift this, this pattern and actually empower citizens to, 
communicate from one extreme of the, of, of the network to, to other extremes. And what this is creating is competition and is creating um, more richer dialogue within that sense can, um, well, with, with, with the challenges that, that the platforms are, are now facing, that, that we, that it's, uh, as, as soon as we empower more citizens to participate and as soon as we decentralize the means of communications for everyone to be a node for uh, a communication uh, between one point on another, on another, we are seeing challenges on, on what, what is accurate information or, or how this information is, is really uh, uh, being constituted. In that sense, um, we are facing these challenges and, and we are aware that we need to, to, to engage in how to, how to promote relevant information. Since its inception, Google has, has, the, has uh, the goal of uh, registering and, and organizing the world's information and make it uh, universally useful and accessible. And in that sense, in our several platforms, for example, YouTube, Search Engine, the Ad, the ad ecosystem embedded uh, within uh, Google, we always uh, put forward the principle that that relevant information should be the, the criteria to actually prioritize something on our platforms. And in that sense, we have been engaging and working uh, with several stakeholders to actually reinforce that in that sense and, and to actually uh, show more relevant information for our users and to make it useful for them and relevant to, their, to whatever the, their means are. And, and it, in that sense, we have created alliances that, like the one we're doing with, uh, with you, with you and with other members of the, of the civil society and academia to actually, um, well, also journalists, to, because we know that this, this is a, a medium which is centralized, but we also know that we need to, to, to work together to uh, show relevant information for its citizens. And well, um, and and I think that I'll leave it there. I, I, I really encourage you to, to actually look for this book and engage in a meaningful uh, reading for the next next days and weeks. Thank you, Manel. I would like to let you know that there are hard copies here for you that Elaine will going to give you at the end of this uh, launch. And also, if you have any questions for the commentaries or for the author at the end of this presentation, please. I will just give a brief, brief comments on this book. I really, I read it this week. I enjoy it. And as it states, there is a challenge for any government to establish a digital democracy which balances right and innovations in a country. That balance is very important, but I would like to start by stating what is digital democracy? And I agree with the definition that Elaine uh, wrote in the book. That means let technology be a tool at service to the community. In other words, the use of technology as a tool that benefits every citizen. And as Ben Cerf mentioned in at Computers Freedom and Privacy event, the internet can facilitate democratic pr practices in unexpected ways. Having said that, we've got to bear in mind that certain conditions shall be met to bring a digital democracy, that is high broadband penetration, a developing economy, increasing demand of ICTs, and an active citizenship. All these factors will facilitate the path to a digital democracy. This is absolutely related to the benefits that a digital democracy brings to society. For example, less corruption. Why? Because it brings transparency. Also, it enables access to public information. With digital democracy in place, the society becomes more collaborative, conditions of inclusion and equality get stronger, and last but not least, the modernization of the states, which in the end benefits all of us. Along the book, you will find an interesting approach of the empowerment that technology brings to the citizens, turning them into citizens 2.0, the importance of an open government and the Peruvian case into the adoption of an open data approach, uh, which has been taking place since 2011, if I'm not wrong. It is, it's kind of a difficult path because of our current political scenario, but it's, it is something that is going, is happening. Also, uh, Elaine shares in the book the learnings and initiatives that 
the National Digital Democracy Award has, has been leveraged since 2014 uh, when its first edition was held. I, I find this initiative a very good practice to replicate in any country because it represents a window to any citizen to share their initiatives and make the government be aware of what they are doing, of what they are expecting to have a closest government in, 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 in the aim of a digital democracy, of course. Chapter three of the book gives very detailed information regarding the proposals that has been sent to digital, um, to, the, to the NGO, and they are divided into different categories for the last five years. So I really invite you to read this chapter three to become a best, best practices uh, to, 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 to replicate. The last chapter is about internet governance and express, exposes sorry, the different challenges that we're facing in terms of human rights on the internet sphere addressing from internet access to fake news, shutdowns, freedom of expression, and the right to be forgotten. I would like to highlight Elaine's proposal to tackle fake news and, to, and the distrust it generates about the internet. Four factors are identified here. First of all, from the side of the tech sector, these companies have tools to develop technical solutions that tackle this reality. And as Manuel said, Google has launched been many, many initiatives. For example, the Google News initiatives. Also, we have the FactorBot, which is a software uh, that Facebook launched within the Messenger app. Likewise, there is a trust project initiatives among div diverse tech companies. Google is part of it as well. And it is a very good first step to take action from the private sector. Also, the second factor is the legal framework. Um, last year, it was mentioned during President Macron's speech, and the, there is a necessity of regulation to strengthening controls aiming to avoid the spread of fake news. Third, third, in third place, media. Elena said the importance of their role in the confirmation of the facts that are shared, in the verification of the sources, and by sharing objective information. Freedom of the press must be reinforced, as well as the labor of the press, whose role represents a counterweight to the information that is spread in social media. Last but not least, so sensibilization. And here, education is on the spot. About this matter, it is essential among the citizenship to be educated. Population need to understand that we cannot believe every information that we see among the internet or that is spread in social media. Being reasonable and accountable users of the internet will contribute to the strengthening of democracy when elections are coming. I believe that in this particular matter, youth initiatives take major importance. So Internet Society and, for example, the Youth Observatory, who Ellison is the chair, we have been organizing several webinars with experts that contribute to our digital literacy and to train us to be responsible Internet users. The Internet is for everyone, and I believe that we're building it, so if we want to prevent negative actions around it, let's be responsible users and be more involved in the public policies, procedures from each of our roles, whether we are students, lawyers, engineers, or artists, because uh, here I'm represented, I am a representative of Internet Society Youth Ambassadors, and our backgrounds are very different. I'm a lawyer, but also there is an um, um, environmental engineer. And we're here because we care about the internet. So we can always contribute something to a trustworthy internet and a digital democracy. I really invite you to read this book and um, take the opportunity to, to speak with Elaine. She's here. She can really share the message, what is happening in Peru, what is going on in the NGO that she runs. Um, I think this is a, good, it's a very good practice to replicate. Thank you very much. Elaine, now I, you have the words. Thank you so much, Elison, Manuel, Paola, great persons and professionals. Thank you all for your participation today. I'm so happy to share my work and effort with the global community at the IGF today. 
This book constitutes my first book. I have immersed myself in this book since the beginning of this year. It has been a continuous work and priority dedication precisely to meet the deadline and be able to reach the International Book Fair in the city of Lima on July 25th, where it was held a big lunch there. This work began with the Cora de Adenauer Foundation in Peru, then the National Election Jury and the National Electoral Process Office, OMPE, joined in this co-edition. The book gathers theory, concepts, the definitions, but also includes current cases and fieldwork, collecting results of some of our initiatives of our digital democracy program that we held in Peru since six years ago, which includes training and awareness work with citizens, politicians, local, regional governments, public entities, technical community, among others. It is a mixture of both. Although the book reflects this, effects, this effort, I must also say that since this digitalization is a global process, this book also contrib contributes to reflection in areas of special interest for any connected society. The book addresses issues that escape the borders of Peru and extend to other latitudes because they are the same challenges, dilemmas, and threats that we all face. The community in Latin America and the Caribbean may feel more identified with what is stated in the book, considering that we have similar realities, demands, and priorities. I want to tell you briefly about the context of the book, these four chapters that I established as the central axis of the work we have undertaken in Peru in these years of our digital democracy program. Chapter one, as, as they all mentioned, and afterwards you can revise in the book that we will give to you. Uh, I must tell you that uh, this was the most complex chapter. Firstly, because it was the first chapter, more difficult to start, the beginning to write, and also because it's the most theoretical. We started from the premise that technology is constantly changing. It is a force that doesn't stop, what Brown calls technological determinism, which redefines the world and governments. Given that, why democracy cannot change? It should also adapt to the new forms and the new revolutions as the technological revolution that is going right now. That's why we start to talking about digital democracy. We have to open this and accept all these changes. But let's ask, what is digital democracy? It is the use of internet and technology at the service of citizens and society to strengthen the rights and freedoms of individuals and to strengthen the process of modernization and innovation in public entities. It is also e-participation, e-deliberation that we explain carefully in the book, this chapter. And also, this chapter considers and revises the scope, the conditions of, and benefits of digital democracy. Chapter two is about digital citizenship, the empowerment and change in the digital area. And it's all about empowered citizens, the citizens 2.0, which has adapted very well to the techno technological times. Also, this chapter uh, revised all about educate in digital citizenship, the need to educate on these topics. And we mentioned the case, for example, of Council of Europe. We must teach them to be responsible digital citizens and prepare them for a world with technology. With technology. Also, to use the critical thinking, use technology in positive terms with respect, with ethics, to protect our security, and the need to design programs from a very young age. We mentioned in this chapter emblematic cases in Peru of uh, mass mobilization uh, that started in year 2013, and we reviewed different cases in the last years also that make important change in Peru, where the digital platforms were uh, the main channel to transport these uh, feelings of, 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 of citizens and of populations. 
And also we, we review different cases uh, of uh, another initiative we have that is the award, the National Digital Democracy Award, where we have uh, beautiful cases and winners where uh, they use the technology for uh, um, social purposes to make changes in society, to alert, to inform, to educate, and all this information and all these big examples and cases, um, you can know more in the book, of course, and there's also some information for you to know about this good experience we promote in Peru in the last years. Also with this chapter, we made a connection between online and the offline world to produce changes. These two worlds must be connected, otherwise changes could not be pro produced. Uh, so we make a big explanation why it is important this and why the need to, um, to all these uh, movements that start online must be finally introduced and a, a, a move to an offline world. In chapter three, I think this is a broader chapter, is the digital time policy. Uh, and we started there uh, with two overviews. One is about uh, uh, politics in the digital age, but with the um, perspective of campaigns in electoral times, in, during electoral process. And here we start uh, talking about um, different things that is happening nowadays all over the world. For example, the distrust of democracy that is going today, the disaffection of political parties. Most citizens doesn't uh, feel that they uh, are close to political parties. And this matches with the boom of social networks. So this convene in a formula that is not so convenient, not so convenient for democracy. No? And the main question here is how can this affect democracy? Here we began to warn of the elements that can be destabilizing and can be risk to democracy. For example, the polarization, the power, of the power struggle, what we all see right now in different platforms such as Twitter, for example, these filter bubbles that appears in, in, this, in this power struggle, this hostile climate, the aggressions, the work of likes, for example, that we see especially in process when there are elections. Uh, all about misinformation, the manipulation of this information that, that, that can also manipulate, for example, in an election, manip can manipulate the vote, and that is a really risk in democracy and that we, we should be very, we should pay a lot of attention to this. Also, populism the emergence of new leaders with extremist speeches, xenophobia, homophobia, misogyny, anti-Semitism, are now uh, trends that we see each day in, in different parts of the world, in different latitudes, but is like a trend that we just see two years ago in Brazil uh, with uh, President Bolsonaro that also is mentioned in the book, how he used these social networks to, uh, to disseminate these, uh, these feelings uh, that affect society and of course affect democracy as well. Uh, and of course this encouraged all about hate speeches that is also a big problem right now that we should attend uh, fast. But by the other side in this book we also um, examine all about the digital platforms in political campaign. We see, for example, the campaign of Obama in year 2008 and the campaign of President Trump in year 2016, each with different styles. But you can see how both use the social media in the different ways. There are two sides of the same coin. So it's important how you see how in year 2008, social media were uh, were used in a correct way and it was a, a, a new perspective of how can social media help democracy. And some years ago, some years afterwards, 
you see the social media can how can it be a risk and how can attempt to democracy so it's important to to see uh, these two experiences and and have an idea of how the use it is made also in this chapter we talk about political parties because um, I feel in the work we've done all these years with political parties that also political parties should get involved in digital transformation. Why not? In Peru, our political parties are very, are very weak and there is a need to use the innovation, to use all, the, all, the, all what offers the new technology to uh, help them to get modernized, to work with more collaboration with citizens, to promote more transparency with the information and all about how the political parties uh, manage their administration and their funds and whatever. In this book, we see also the Peruvian efforts and the main limitations. And also we check all about open government and open data, because this is important for the public ent entities, how they, for example, build their portal of open data portals and how they open their information to citizens. And with this, how they collaborate with the technical community and how they can collaborate with citizens. And this is a good step we are making in Peru, in different local governments and in some regional governments, but we must continue with this work because the technology allows us to use this in a good way and we can uh, strengthen our democracy with this information, with this data that can be open. There we mention uh, a good initiative we have in Peru and we promote since some years ago that is called Innovap innovation and openness in the public administrations. And there we had trained different um, uh, authorities in local governments and in local re uh, regional governments and their main um, staff on using that technology to strengthen their administrations. Finally, the chapter four it's about internet governance and human rights online. This chapter was very important, uh, and it was tremendously enriching chapter. But it's important for Peru, and, and I can say for most countries in, in Latin America, because internet governance is not so, um, so familiar to, to people. They don't know the importance that citizens, for example, and all actors uh, have in, in the in the development of internet, and all of us have an important role. So uh, for this chapter, I review all material, document, report books that I have brought every year of my participation in international forums, and especially in, in the internet governance forums that I always used to take to Peru. And then I review all these and, and, and try to, to fill them up to, to make this chapter. Uh, we review all about internet governance. Uh, we highlight the multi-stakeholder and the bottom-up model, um, and, the, and the need to all of us to intervene. No? Uh, also about the human rights online, we start with mentioning the, the efforts that have been done by the Council of Europe with the Human Rights Guide for Internet Users. Uh, it should be clear that it's not about new rights, it is based on existing conventions and instruments that protect human rights. These apply equally offline and online. And we make a emphasis in the access, in the freedom of expression, in participation, in privacy, education, literacy. Um, and we mention, of course, other efforts as the Association for the Progress of Communications, the Dynamic Coalition, uh, that they have made also different documents about human rights online. Um, we mentioned all about internet access, community networks, and different instruments and, um, and documents that have been published to promote human rights online. Also, what it is, internet universality that is, um, that is uh, right now promoted and uh, led by UNESCO. In, in this chapter, we make a, we give special attention to all about a freedom of expression online because all over uh, 
in all times, this right has been violated. No, and nowadays we see this with censorship, with blockage, with blackouts, with control, with espionage, with surveillance, uh, current practices as shutdowns, and different kinds of censors that affect this right. And of course, we must mention all about fake news, the presence of trolls, bots, and fake accounts that we see uh, with more frequently uh, in, the, in the social media, and especially when elections process appears. No? So this is more frequently when we have uh, um, elections campaign. In, in every country, this is abroad. No? This is all over the world. Um, from digital democracy, we have worked a lot uh, during electoral process. Uh, we prepare our citizen guides on these topics, and we have made and designed different activities with different actors to alert them about um, fake news, about how they should conduct in the social media, and how can they use, they must use a in a responsible way internet and new technologies. And as um, Paola mentioned, um, also in the book mentions the four fronts that um, to give response to these, um, these uh, threats that appears, no? And the answer, the response that give the tech corporations, as Manuel mentioned from Google, the, the response that governments make, what mass media associations uh, are making, and what civil society are doing too, and should do, uh, working with citizens to create awareness about fake news and, and all these new threats that could be a real threat to democracy. Uh, well, what I want to show in this book are um, mainly the benefits of internet that has been created to serve humanity. This has been our principles of work since the beginning. Also, of course, we showed an alert about the negative elements that have arisen and that will appear uh, in the following years. Uh, new, new threats will appear, of course. But the main thing here is that we should not demonize the internet. Today are these problems, but tomorrow other problems will arise as technology evolves and evolves fast. So new problems will be appear and new threats will appear as well. So we have to face them in the best way, minimizing their impact with a, a multi-stakeholder approach where we all participate and where we all can tackle this. Uh, it is not necessary to break the essence of internet conceive uh, to serve the humanity. So I think the great concern should be nowadays to connect the half of the global uh, population, and in Peru, for example, also the half of the population in the country that should access to internet. And I can imagine that the same happens to most of the countries in Latin America, where there's a great percentage of people who doesn't access to internet at the moment. Well, I must say uh, some of the anecdotes of this work it has been that most of the documents I read were in English. There is a small, um, a, a little things written in Spanish, a small literacy uh, in Spanish. Um, so I think uh, this, this book is a great contribution in our language. Uh, and that's why I think La Community could, could be really um, um, really, uh, this could be useful for our community, you know, for, for yeah. all our countries, because as I say also, we have the same problems, priorities, and demands of our populations. Uh, I think what's important to give this step, after six years working in this digital democracy program, this step to publish the book, uh, it was a good step to, um, to compile all this work, all this effort, and all these uh, learnings, all this information that we have reviewed in all these years. And I hope this is a good contribution for you all. Uh, we have also an online version that you can uh, uh, access uh, by going to the website digitaldemocraciadigital.pe. I think uh, uh, in, the, in the flyer appears at the end. 
And I have some copies for you. <laughs> uh, if you want, I can sign it for you as well. And I hope it will be useful to you all. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions regarding the book? Of Yes. I may approach. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Margaret Lopez. I am a journalist from Venezuela. I am also a fellow for the program of Open Internet uh, Leaders Initiative. And I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one uh, to the representative of the Google Mexico. Um, I wonder if what is exactly the policy of the Google about the transparency um, in the case of the acts? Uh, Facebook, for example, um, recently published all the um, um, actors that uh, buy ads in, in different countries, especially the development in just United States, Spain. And I want to know if the Google in Latin uh, plans to, to do some similar uh, policy. And my second question is for the author. And um, you start the, the book with a with a f little phrase about the linking between the democracy and the technology and how the people understand. And I wonder if the one of the workshops that uh, you uh, um, manage in the different uh, uh, points, place in, in, in Peru, what the people understand uh, really means of the democracy, digital democracy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very relevant question. Uh, regarding our recent updates on, on, on political ads, um, as you know, there has been a lot of uh, buzz going on around what we, the tech companies, are doing around this. Uh, our position has, has been very simple, and, and we disclosed this uh, two weeks ago by Kent Walker, which is our, uh, our senior VP for uh, Global Affairs. We have tailored uh, political ads, uh, restricted tailoring of political ads only for, uh, for uh, gender, age, and postal code location. And that's it. That's the only the restriction of the, uh, of the ads. And regard, well, actually, another important update that, that we gave two weeks ago regarding uh, transparency is that we are in, strength, uh, in the process of strengthening our, our transparency reports. In, ha in fact, they are public. Let me give you the exact, the exact link for it. It's transparencyreport.google.com. And you can see that so far we are uh, starting to roll out tailoring of these reports. So far we have uh, three regions available. The United States, which you can classify for, for, for internal uh, US state, India, and the European Un uh, Union. Yeah, I, yes, uh, actually I don't have that precise information, but the process in Google uh, sometimes t takes time to, to roll out uh, certain, I don't have the exact date, yeah, yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's a way forward and, and we are totally uh, thinking on how to strengthen transparency. Hi, thank you for your question. Uh, well, I must say that this has been a, a long work for people to understand what is digital democracy. I must say that always the, the million dollar question was, what is digital democracy? So I always start explaining what is this, you know, the importance for the freedom and the rights of individuals, and also for different actors, as for example, the public entities. But this work um, has been a, a long, has a long way. We have developed in these years more than 10 lines of action with different methodolo methodolo methodology, with different uh, approaches, workshops, forums, um, different initiatives such as the prize. We have just launched and the National um, Digital Democracy Observatory. Uh, and this is a work that doesn't stop. So we try to reach these topics in different ways with different audiences for they all to understand. What I think is this book will help them 
to learn more, to understand uh, how this can be helpful for them and for their society. Uh, just to co uh, try to complete something, is that, uh, well, the way I see is that until some years ago, we just have one big problem that is in try to connect people, like to try to give them the access to internet. Right now, we have two, because we have a lot of people that are not connected, and we have a lot of people that are connected and don't have the access to the knowledge to explore the potential of this tool that, that they have. Exactly, they do not understand what they can do, what are the possibilities and everything. So uh, I think that projects and initiatives like the, this book, like the organization that Elaine uh, made, the, a, a lot of uh, projects that Google have that a lot of companies and, and organizations have over there are the, are, is, are the kind of initiatives that can make a change. Uh, I know it's going to be a really like long uh, work to do, but I think that we are try well, we are making the situation uh, better, but we have a lot more work to do to change things. Um, in some countries we have, well, uh, in Latin America we have like different situations between the countries and in the world, well, everyone knows that we have a like, lot of different cultures, uh, as access to technology, to, know, to knowledge and everything. So I think right now that we have internet, that we have technology is the time for us to try to like connect everything and make like a, a really good and big move in every country, in every, in every organization, in everything, to try to, to reach it, like to reach this objective that is give the people the, the power, empower them to use, to have access to these tools, to use it for the good. And initiatives like that, uh, compilation of information like this are the good things that are happening now and are helping us to reach this objective. Just very quick, but as Ellison stated, examples of that is, for example, the webinars that are held by the Youth Observatory. Also, Elaine is the president of the Peruvian chapter of Internet Society, and they also are doing these webinars. And what I would like to, for example, a learning that I'm bringing back home is that we are, we must spread the message. People must know that there are free webinars uh, for young people, for that there are free digital literacy courses from Google, Microsoft, Facebook. I mean, every company has these free courses and people don't know. So we need to spread the message. Here in IGF are many information uh, that are being shared. So it is on our ass, it's, uh, as I said, uh, from every role, every role we have, it is whether it is students or lawyers, even government representatives, we can spread the message. We can be like this little step to uh, have a better internet for everyone. Yeah, if I can wake it in. Um, yeah, it's true. Um, in fact, Google is so committed with, with a wide array of efforts to protect like, uh, electoral campaigns that I want to encourage you to actually Google Mm, uh, look for this information mm, that I'm going to be telling you. We have a recently published paper called uh, How Google Fights Misinformation, and it clearly, it clearly details all the, all the efforts that we have been doing in this, in this space. It's based around three, three frameworks or, or three strategies. The first one is make quality count in our ranking systems. As I was explaining, uh, all platforms of Google are based on rankings, and we are strengthening high quality count 
uh, quality uh, in the sense for it to be able to count for how, how it appears in the ranking systems. The second strategy is we are proactively engaging to counteract uh, malicious actors. Um, and the third is giving users more control. So it's, it's, it's a very short uh, paper. I think it's around 40 pages, so it's, uh, it's very good to, to, to read. And, and yeah, like, uh, like uh, we were saying, there are some other things in the fields of, in, of strengthening news information production that, that we are working on. We have the Google, the Google News Initiative, which actually engages directly with journalists to teach them how to verify information, how to use uh, technical tools to verify the information they are, they are creating. Uh, we train them in, in special courses to use Google Maps to, to locate uh, the scenes of, of, of where the news are happening, the locations of, of, of the news. We teach them how to, to proactively engage uh, within the Google News platform to, for, for their contents to be more available and, and more readable to, to, to users and to readers. Uh, we also have, I don't know if you know the, the Jigsaw the, uh, sister company within Alphabet. Jigsaw is actually promoting some technical uh, resources, a wide array of technical resources to actually protect information within electoral times. We have uh, a Project Shield for political campaigns and for NGOs and journalists, which Project Shield is a very interesting project, which actually uh, gives uh, these uh, special users uh, within the news industry, journalism, and NGOs, a special account uh, with the highest security protections uh, and makes them, lets them use our cloud infrastructure for free to be able to protect themselves from DDoS attacks, which you know, in the const, in, 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 as, as the book mentioned in the fourth chapter, uh, the actions of some bad actors to take down co uh, content via DDoS attacks and, and internet shutdowns, when you have resiliency and technical resiliency uh, with these free tools, you can counteract that. So those are practical measures that we are practically engaging in order to, to protect uh, the, the wellness of the information ecosystem. Uh, other things that we are doing is uh, the Google's Advanced Protection Program, which, well, I, I mentioned this, it's, uh, it, we, gave, uh, we, we give users uh, uh, two-step verification devices to, to, to have their, their Gmail accounts with the strongest uh, security level uh, protections. And well, at, at the end, what we want to do is actually uh, strengthen trust in the digital world. As we were mentioning, six out of 10 people in Latin America uh, are living a newly different experience on how they engage in democratic processes, and, and we want to build trust in that sense. Yes, we have. We have three questions, yes? Maybe one, two, and... Oh. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Weidinger, and I'm um, a member of Democracy Without Borders. And uh, my question is, what do you think about e-voting as an element of digital democracy? And the second question, or maybe related even, what do you think about digital democracy enabling supranational democracy up to maybe one day a global level, or did you touch on these issues on your book? Because that's issues we are dealing with. So it's interesting for me. Okay. Let's listen. Okay. All, all the questions? Okay. Or, yeah? Thank you. Uh, my name is Damar. I'm the founder of Indonesia Freedom of... Eh, sorry. Uh, Digital Democracy Forum in Indonesia. Uh, I am also executive di director of Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. So first of all, I have two questions. First of all, I want to congratulate, uh, con uh, give congratulations to Elaine for the books. Uh, and also, I want to ask uh, whether do you have any plan to uh, have a roadshow to Indonesia as well. Uh, we, are, we are asking uh, your expertise and your books here to be discussed in, in, in Indonesia. That's the first question. And then the second, um, we uh, I found the uh, uh, I built the Indonesia uh, Digital Democracy Forum in 2014. Uh, at that time, uh, we are very happy with because of the internet helping us a lot 
to choose a, a good what 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 we call a good uh, uh, president, but uh, it only stays for uh, five years, and now we are facing in the we are facing a new uh, a, a new uh, uh, a new uh, apa ya? a new part when we are we are start to thinking that the actually the digital is destroying the democracy. Uh, since uh, this is totally different from 2014, in 2019, we are facing the, I think, the death of the democracy because of the digital. And we are uh, asking whether, uh, do you have any plan to, uh, to see uh, what happened in Peru after five years from now? Uh, because in uh, Arab Spring, for, for instance, uh, five years after the Arab Spring, the digital democracy is also dying here, uh, there. So uh, it's happened in Indonesia as well. So I'm, I'm asking, uh, do you have any plan to have at least a sequel of, the, uh, of, of this book? Thank you. Hi, I just have a specific comment. Uh, well, I'm Peruvian, and as a woman working in Peru in digital rights also, I just want to highlight and your effort in writing this book. I think it's very important to contribute to the knowledge that exists about technology, democracy, etc. from our context, from the South, because it is important. And there is not a lot of work on this, especially from the context of Peru. So just that, congratulations. Okay, thank you so much for your questions. Um, I will start with, uh, with you about e-voting. Uh, well, in Peru right now, we are, um, the OMP, one of the offices that um, is um, helping the co-edition of this book, is responsible to promote the e-voting process uh, in our country. Uh, and they started some years ago, but in different local areas like first with the pilot plans and afterwards uh, extending that to some local governments in the main cities of the country. And the results are good uh, because uh, um, they have shown a more modernization, more fast results, more transparency, more security. But in the last month, there are some uh, political actors that are um, trying to um, to, I don't know what to say, but to, to mention all the negative impacts that e-voting can cause in democracy. And showing other examples in the world that, uh, of countries that they don't use uh, e-voting for different reasons. So right now is a big discussion about this, if they should continue or not with the process of e-voting, because also the e-voting is very costly you know, for our countries, that they are not so rich countries. Can you imagine this? this um, um, it is a, a good inversion, you know, investment. So, so right now, I think, well, th this is a discussion. But in a public policy decision, they are continuing with this. We have actually elections in January, Congress elections, and we will still use this e-voting system. But I don't know which will be the, uh, uh, the um, uh, how you say, how this will continue, how this discussion will continue in the country. No, let's be aware and let's be listening what they say, which are, the main arguments of the different parts that are discussing this. About um, the digital democracy in a supranational level, uh, well, we haven't get yet <laughs> to, that, to that level of discussion. I must say that our work has been very recognized in Peru and in a lot of countries in Latin America. And most of, um, well, most of the people that were in our network, they always ask me if they can extend this work we've done to different countries in, for example, South America or in Central America. But that's, 
that is a decision that we are also thinking about because our main focus was to spread all our work in all the country, in all Peru. And that's a challenge, and it's a challenge because not all Peru have access, as access to internet. And as more uh, regions in Peru have access to the internet, then we can reach our program to all these regions. And this is a work that is a process. It's step by step. It's not so fast, and it's not from day to night. No, It is a process that we must wait, and we must wait also that the public policy to, to, um, for promoting the access to internet should allow more people in Peru access to internet and to be connected, okay? Uh, about, I think, I, I hope I answer your question. Um, about Indonesia, uh, well, thank you so much for your invitation. I will be very glad and very honored to, to, to help you with this process of digital democracy. Um, yes, well, you mentioned, I don't like to, to see this idea of um, internet, digital technologies destroying our democracy. I always look with a positive uh, view. And I, what I always say, these problems and threats will appear always, always. It depends on us. It depends on the on the way how humans, how individuals act, and how they use internet, with which purpose. So problems will arise always. And what we must do, our big, our big challenge is to, to try to defeat them, or try to face them in the best way, for the impact will be the less in our population and society. And I can show you here, please, Alvaro, can you uh, share with, with him uh, this book? Well, it is in Spanish, but in this book we have a beautiful initiative in Peru that is called uh, the Digital Democracy National Award. It's an award that we give every year since six years ago to different initiatives in four categories, citizens, social, uh, civil society, public sector and private sector, and how they use different technologies, could be any social media, any website, any blog, any app, but with good purpose, you know, to make changes in society, in their local areas, in their communities, to teach them, to alert, to our, make, create awareness, to give services, uh, to, with different purpose, but with a positive uh, purpose, no? to make changes and good changes in society. And you can see how there are, we have six years doing this, and each year we have more and more initiatives that participate in this award. And we have at the moment almost 350 initiatives from different places in Peru that they are convened in a, an observatory that we have just launched last week in, in Peru, and that is the Digital Democracy National Observatory. You can check also the website in democraciadigital.pe slash observatorio. Uh, it has been launched last week, and, and it's a beautiful experience on how initiative, how social media, how different technological platforms can serve democracy, and, can, and how can serve humanity, individuals, and our society. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, hello. So I'm Mario Belling from OpenTech. Um, uh, we are a company with offices in Europe and Asia. So yeah, I, I think it's really great that you work on this subject. Uh, I had the chance to be uh, last year, uh, not in Peru, but in Chile. We had the Open Hardware Summit there at the, universe, uh, the Catholic University. Um, so I think like a lot of what is going on in your region, um, we don't know about it here in Europe and Asia. So it's really important um, uh, to see how you share this and, and um, to have your book. And uh, personally, like, we are working on, on open source. We feel like we can really share a lot uh, with other people. Like we found several business uh, ways to do business, to earn income, open source, like you can share the code 
um, but uh, there are different business models that you can do. And um, I would like to know from you, um, yeah, how, what opportunities do you see for people to use open source um, in the region? Also in the light that we see in different parts of the world, for example, that the internet gets more restricted, that there are um, technologies um, um, that are proprietary. Um, we see, for example, uh, some governments introducing um, yeah, really restrictive uh, controls of the internet um, that um, yeah, prevent access for normal people. We techies, we can always find a solution. Yeah? But like a, a lot of people who want to have free access to the internet, um, they're restricted by technology. So there's one time, uh, on one side, the government. Um, um, I was, I was last, just last year in, in China, for example, and yeah, it's really difficult to get free access to the internet. You have the intranet in China, right? But on the other hand, we also see like technologies like, for example, voice assistance, where we actually access um, in future, the internet through voice. We talk to Alexa or we talk to Google Home, right? And these are great technologies, but they go through one company. And this company basically controls our access. So that's not like us going to many different websites, but we go to one company and this company decides if we have access or not. And we see this very restrictive uh, policy, for example, of Google um, that prevent us to use certain services. So the question is, what do you see in Latin America uh, in regards to um, uh, yeah, open source and open access to the internet also for the future um, when we think of restrictive governments and restrictive companies like Google? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will start this, your answer, and uh, then I will give it to Manuel. He's from Google, so he can explain you better. Well, in Peru is a process about this. Um, uh, there are many initiatives that use open sources, but I think uh, there is much more to do. Um, and it depends also in how um, we uh, create awareness about the open sources. I should say that most people doesn't understand well what is the, the, the scope of the open sources and the benefits of the open sources, especially from um, um, public entities. And sometimes, you know, they are afraid of their information. They don't want to be sure. Um, but in that way, uh, not exactly open source, but in open data, what, what we are trying to do from digital democracy is to work directly with local and regional governments to help them and to explain them the benefits to open their data in uh, open data portals no? to, for people and for the technical community use this information, reuse the information, and, and to build different solutions and technology tools that can help society. And also to work in collaboration with the citizens. Uh, we are doing a, a hard work over that, especially open data. So, so I think, as I always said, it's, it's a process. And it's a lot to do to educate and to create awareness about all this and the benefits that this could offer. Yeah, thank you. So I. Yeah, um, well, honestly, I would uh, respectfully disagree a little bit that, that we control uh, access to, to our platforms. I mean, in a sense, we, we need to do it because uh, we, we, have, uh, we need to, to gain a certain way to standardize how our, how, uh, the, our different uh, applications work with other partners' applications. Uh, but I think within the industry, we are the most uh, open. Uh, we always try to to build the most open ecosystems because that's a Google policy in that sense. We we strongly believe that, uh, in the sense that we are more open and and that we restrict less what comes into our ecosystems, we gain. Uh, well, the whole ecosystem gains more. In that sense, for example, if you see a uh, Play Store, the the Android ecosystem, uh, it's the most open. Uh, Play Store's uh, ecosystem uh, available. Uh, we strive for for uh, building open ecosystems in that sense, and 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 strive really hard to find uh, interoperability between different uh, devices and different hardwares. 
uh, for example, uh, uh, I, I am trying to recall the last numbers, but I, I, I think the last number I saw on, on how many devices we can plug into the Android ecosystem, uh, it's 25,000 around, around that. So that really uh, gives you a sense of how, how we strive to, to be interoperable. Also now with Google Home devices, if you see the app and you want, when you want to add another device, there is uh, within the app the, the option of, of linking uh, Google devices like Google Home or Google Wi-Fi or now the Nest, the, the, the Nest hardware applications or Fitbit in a few months. But if you see the, the other button, it actually really uh, uh, lets you plug in other devices and select from a I never seen the, the 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 full list, but I suppose they are perhaps around 300 different uh, brands, or p perhaps a thousand, because the, the list is so long that I haven't had the time to actually scroll it down all the way in the in the Google Home application. And in that sense, um, our products have have always been built in uh, for trying to achieve the maximum uh, the maximum amount of interoperability. But also we have the 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 responsibility of controlling it in, in, in a sense, but with the least controls possible, just to give a, a very good user experience what comes into our platforms. Yeah, I think this is a, a very good approach, um, but um, this approach currently is limited to Google and uh, maybe very close partners, and I don't see that uh, it is really like uh, open up to the open source community and open source companies. I mean, when we look at the community, it's like the Linux Foundation, the, the IBM, really oh, yeah. big players, right? So, so yeah, I would love to see more of this happening. And also in regards to digital sovereignty, um, which is a big topic here in Germany, for example, um, opening up the platforms and really um, make standards that are interoperable with other companies, actually, not just you know, it, that Google works with other Google devices, that is kind of obvious and that you want to achieve that. But um, that you basically close platforms um, access from the outside, except if they submit to Google policies, right? Which is like sometimes even not in line with European law. And uh, well, you know, like these processes are very long and so on. So we yeah. would wish like Google have a much more proactive um, approach to actually um, let companies from Europe and from Asia, um, where we are present, um, yeah, like work with you guys and work yeah. with the platform. And the Android uh, platform is a great platform, but it's not an open model that where we can participate. It's open source, but it's not an open model. I think we can really go into detail. Maybe there are other events where we can also follow up about this. So, um, so I think like this uh, discussion is really important. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. No, totally. Actually, well, it is not my, uh, my field of, of expertise. I'm a, I'm a policy uh, person, not a technical person, but I can totally direct you with the proper uh, uh, people within the Google organization to, to actually give you more context about it. But I think uh, it's in our DNA to strive to be as, as more open as possible. Well, thank you very much all for your part uh, active participation. We are running on out of time. I think everyone has got a, a hard copy. And there is the link where you can access the digital book. And well, thank you very much for, for your participation. Thank <laughs> you.